Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago. We're in Exodus chapter 14, looking at part two of 1,200 flat tires all at once, or is there a manufacturing de defect lawsuit hidden in the text? <laughs> You're aware of all those manufacturing defect lawsuits that are going on about automobiles right now. Exodus chapter 14, verses 21 through 31. Now last week when we looked at part one, we learned a number of basic principles which we'll be developing, the Lord willing, a little bit later. But in verse 21 we learned that obedience produces blessing and fulfillment of the promises of God. Verse 21 we also learned sometimes it takes a season for God to answer our requests. Each has part in the fulfillment. God said to Moses, stretch out your hand. When Moses did it, then God acted. If Moses had not obeyed, we do not know what would have happened, but probably nothing would have happened because God expects obedience before he acts. We also learn from verse 21, when part of creation can fulfill the will of God, he uses it. The land was dry after being blown on for the duration of the night. It was dry, it was not mud, and it was not marsh. We also learn in verse 21 that each party does his part. God is the one with the supernatural power, so he empowers us individually, but he is the one who actually accomplishes what gets done. Verse 21 also parallels what happened at creation. You remember as we look back into Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, we saw light being separated from darkness, and here we have light being separated from darkness, the Shekinah glory standing between the two. We have a parting, a dividing of the waters in Genesis when God created, when he divided the waters that are above the firmament from the waters that are beneath the firmament. So we find here another parallel to creation because God is creating again, except at this time he's creating a new nation, the nation of Israel. All through the Old Testament, every time the formation of Israel as a nation is mentioned, we go back to the Red Sea. God gave promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they weren't a nation at that time. They were a family. And it was the family of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that went down into Egypt and were there for 400 years and developed into a great people, but they were not yet a nation. They were subservient, subservient slave people. But the crossing of the sea is the point at which God created something new. He created Israel as a nation. Remember back in Genesis 1, 9, and 10, God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear also, and it was so. That's what we got going on here. The waters are gathering together. They're being divided, and dry land is appearing in the midst. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. And what he's doing here is also good. Verse 22, we saw that in the midst, or the middle of the sea, on dry ground, they went through. It was not like the liberals say, they waded through the marshes at the north end of the Gulf of Suez. You know, one of the things you can look at whenever you look at a commentary, if you're going to buy a commentary of the Old Testament, go over to the book of Exodus and see what it says about the crossing of the Red Sea. Whether or not it claims that it's a genuine miracle of God where they actually went through on dry ground between two walls of water or whether or not it has the Israelites because they're traveling light being able to wade through the mud and Pharaoh's chariots getting stuck in the mud. Or whether or not they say it's the Red Sea or they say, well, it's really the Sea of Reeds because a papyrus plant is a reed and, you know, so uh, that's called a border. Uh, those are border plants and since they grow along the border of the sea, it must have been the up northern border, you know, if they start doing stuff like that, don't buy the commentary. It's full of trash. If they waffle on the greatest miracle after creation, if they waffle on the crossing of the Red Sea and don't have a genuine miracle in the text, you know they're going to compromise other stuff in the text. It's an easy way to check out commentaries. We also notice that the walls, the waters were a wall on both sides, not just on one side. With the crossing of the Jordan River, you have the waters backing up on one side when, in the days of Joshua. But here we have walls of water on both sides, which means there was deep water on both sides of where the Israelites were crossing. There was no way to get around them. Pharaoh couldn't circumvent them and come in from the other side. And the walls protected them as well as keeping them focused on where they're going. You know, sometimes God puts walls in our lives. And he puts walls on both sides 
so that we can't run a different direction, we have only one way to go. If God wants you to go someplace and do something, he will make it possible. He will also hedge you about with his protection. He guarantees that. And he will get you safely to the other side. Very practical lessons that we can learn from the way God dealt with Israel here. We noticed also that the term wall, there are 12 different Hebrew words that are used to translate the word wall in the text. We looked at Sha'ur, a fence around a pasture, Kira, a wall built in a trench, Gwadare, an enclosure, a hedge, Chayel, an army rampart, a trench or a bulwark, Usharnana, an upright wall, Geder, which is a circumvallation, which is an emphasis on enclosing something like a sheepfold. Kotel, and you're familiar with that word, I think. If you know anything about Israel, that's the word that's used of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Hayetz, that which separates the inside from the outside. Harutz, which is a trench barricade, where instead of having something going up, you've got something going down that you can't get across. And then we saw the word in our text, which is Choma. That's a protecting wall. It's a massive city wall. We looked at a whole bunch of places where that word is used. We looked where it is defined as a city wall. And it's defined that way in the book of Leviticus in chapter 25, verses 29 through, 30, 20, excuse me, 29 through 31 of Leviticus 25. If a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it. And then it goes down to verse 31. But the houses of the village which have no wall round about them shall be counted as the fields of the country. They shall be redeemed. They shall go out in the Jubilee. We saw that this is not just talking about some little city wall because it's the word that's used for the wall of Jericho that fell flat. And there were actually houses that were built upon that wall. It says Rahab's house was built upon that wall. And this is the word Choba that is used in Jericho chapter 2. We also saw that this was the word used for the wall of Beit Shan, where the bodies of Saul and his sons were hung. That's over in 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 8 through 13. If you're jotting down the references, I'm not going to go over all of it. But it talks about how uh, after the battle at Gilboa, remember Saul had been to the witch at Endor the night before. God had forbidden that kind of thing. God had told Saul, kill all the witches in the land. He had failed to do it. His servants knew immediately where there was one still there. And so Saul went to her. She said, look, if I do this, you know, Saul's going to kill me. He says, look, I, I swear that, uh, you know, nothing will happen to you. She tries to call up her medium spirit. And instead, the spirit of Samuel shows up. And she's terrified. And Samuel says, you know, you're going to be with me tomorrow. And sure enough, next day, Saul is killed and three of his sons, including Jonathan, the best friend of David, are killed on the mountains of Gilboa. And so they cut off Saul's head, just like David had done with Goliath's head. And then they hung the body of Saul and his three sons to the wall of Beit Shan. Verse 10, they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth. They fastened his body to the wall of Beit Shan. That's this massive city wall, same word that's used here in our text. And it says, when the inhabitants of Gil Jabesh Gilead heard of what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from off the wall of Beit Shan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tree at Jabesh and fasted for seven days. We also discover that's the same word that was used for the wall surrounding the city where Uriah the Hittite was killed. Remember, David has committed adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, <clears throat> he calls Uriah home from the battle because Bathsheba's told him she's pregnant. And uh, so he thinks, man, I've got to cover this somehow. And uh, so he says, Uriah gets a report from the battle, says, now go home and spend the night with your wife. And Uriah says, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, all the king's men are out there on the front lines. I mean, why should I enjoy this kind of pleasure? I think he probably had heard some rumors. So he didn't do it. So the next day, David wrote a letter, sent it to Joab, the commander in chief, and said, look, I want you to send Uriah up next to the wall and we suspect he'll get killed if that happens. And sure enough, that's what happened. At 2 Samuel 11, Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war to unto the king, and if it be so, the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approach ye so nigh of the city when you did fight? I knew, I knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall. That's the city wall, great big city wall, same word. Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabesh? Who did not a woman cast a piece of millstone from the wall? And he died in Thebes. Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. 
And the message said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field. And we were upon them even unto the entry of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants. And some of the king's servants be dead. The servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. It was a massive city wall being attacked by an army. That's what the walls of war... Why am I emphasizing this? Because people, you need to understand, this is a genuine miracle that is taking place in the Old Testament. God chose the specific word. He could have chosen any of the other 12 words for wall, but he chose the one for the biggest, most powerful, most massive city wall that is used in the entire Old Testament. Walls of water! You're looking up, and you're looking up, and you're looking up, and you can't see the top. It's about 600 feet deep in the Red Sea at that particular point. That's like a 60-story skyscraper. A 60-story skyscraper. Think of the skyscrapers that you've seen. And you look up, and you look up, and you look up. Now, if you look at them from a distance, you can see the whole thing. But if you're standing here right next to the thing and looking up 60 stories, that's how high the walls of water were on either side of the children of Israel. Is God trying to tell us something about his power and his majesty and his Godhead? You look at the universe, that's even taller. And that's why Paul says, so that they are without excuse, Romans chapter 1. We see that that was the city wall of Abel Bet Maaka, which was a strongly, heavily fortified city. It's used that way over in 2 Samuel 20, verse 15. They came and besieged him in Abel of Bet Maaka, and they cast up a bank against the city and stood in the trench, and all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. That's a city wall. That's It's used of the wall of uh, Jerusalem in the days of Solomon, which was the greatest city wall at that time. First Kings 3, 1 Kings 3.1 And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh king of Egypt and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Choma. I mentioned just in passing last week but the principal theme of the book of Nehemiah is about the city wall of Jerusalem. That's the word. Choma. A protecting wall, a massive city wall. It's the only word used for the wall of Jerusalem in the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 1, verse 3, They said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Chapter 2, verse 8, And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to his house, and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God. I have many, many verses here that I've written out of Nehemiah. We won't go over all of them. But read through the book of Nehemiah. Every time you see the word wall, it's choma. The same word that is used for the walls of water that stood on either side of the Jews as they crossed the Red Sea. So now remember now, we are here in our text in Exodus today. Six million people and I think that's a minimum. Six million people were clearly not wading through the mud of a swamp. The reason for the strong east wind blowing all night, which would have come off this dry Saudi Arabian desert, was to evaporate and dry the seabed, not to hold up the walls of water. Now think about this for a second, people. If there was a wind that was strong enough to hold up walls of water that are 600 feet high, it would have blown the Israelites and the Egyptians all the way across Africa. The reason for the wind, God held back that, the walls of water, but then he sent the east wind to dry up the ground because they walked across. It emphasizes it three times in the text. Dry ground through the midst of the sea. It wasn't the wind that was holding up the walls. I know of a fellow who preaches that God blew through the nostrils, through his nostrils, which he thinks is the Gedi Pass and the Mitla Pass, uh, up farther in the north bend of the Suez, and uh, that... Those were the nostrils of God that blew the wind and um, you know, held back the waters. He also thinks space aliens were involved. Bizarre, some of you people know him. Anyway, that's not what's going on in the text. If there was a hurricane force wind big enough to push a slot through the water, it would be blowing water all over Egypt and all over every place and blowing the Egyptians and all the Israelites all over the place and there wouldn't be a horse that could stand up against that, much less a chariot. That's not what took place. 
God held back the walls, the wind dried the land, and the children of Israel walked through on dry ground. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. The reason the Egyptians went in behind the Jews, I think there are two reasons. Number one, fear of Pharaoh, and that was very clearly greater than their fear of a miraculous phenomenon. They had begged, but they never rebelled during the ten supernatural plagues against Egypt. You know, they could have said, Pharaoh is a jerk. He's as crazy as a loon. We're not going to obey him anymore because look at what's happening to our country. They saw the supernatural hand of God already ten times. And they obeyed Pharaoh. Now they come to another ch chance to, hey, choose the right side, and they didn't do it. Pharaoh says to him, okay, guys, go forward into the sea. You know, their ra rationale, well, you know, <laughs> Maybe if the walls of water fall, it'll get the Jews too. So then, hey, that solves our problem. Or if there is a God, maybe he'll take care of us. That's what I call stupid trust in a wrong God. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. That brings us to the next section of the text. Verse 24. It came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked into the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, which as you know, we've discussed in detail, the Shekinah glory, and troubled the host of the Egyptians. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. And this is almost hilarious when you think about it. He could have done all kinds of things. He could have just smitten them dead if he wanted to. But he was going to make a point. He took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. You can imagine them. The wheels all fall off all at once and the horses are there pulling the chariots and the drivers are trying to get the horses to go. It says drave them heavily. You're right, dragging the chariots without any wheels. So that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Now we have some very obvious observations that we can make on the text right off the bat. First of all, the Egyptians knew the name of the true God. You notice it's all in capital letters. The Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. L-O-R-D. When you see all capitals, that's the name Yahweh, sometimes translated Jehovah, but Yahweh. It's a tetragrammaton is what it's called. Four Hebrew consonants. Very few Hebrew words have four consonants in them. Most have three. And then you add the vowels up over beyond... <laughs> Uh, all around the, the consonants to give the different pronunciations. But here we've got the Tetragrammaton, the name Yahweh. They knew who he was. They understood it was a supernatural phenomenon that was happening. This isn't something that happens by accident. Maybe one chariot loses a wheel. Okay, everybody else carries on. But every chariot lost all of its wheels. They knew it was Jehovah. They knew his name. Number two, the Egyptians knew that they were facing and fighting against the true God. But get this, they continued to do it until the very last possible minute. Nothing had deterred them up to that point. You know, they'd seen the witness of God's chosen people for years, just like America has heard the gospel for years and still rejected it. Just remember, even in America, as then in Egypt, stubborn rebellion always fights against God until it's too late. Don't be in that group. You don't want to be found fighting against God until it's too late. Gamaliel had that kind of wisdom. Paul's teacher. But you know what? Although he got a temporary break, the Jews still continued to persecute the Christians. Let me have some questions uh, that we need to resolve here. You know, if you're going to talk to the liberals about the text, they're going to scoff and mock at you on the issues that I'm going to raise right now. These are key issues. You need to know the answers. There are real answers to these questions. This is where a lot of neo-evangelicals back down 
in the text about crossing the Red Sea. And they waffle and they say, well, maybe, 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 you know. There are real answers to the real challenges. You need to know them because this is where the devil attacks in the Old Testament. He attacks the crossing of the Red Sea. Because Satan hates Israel. He doesn't want a miraculous beginning for the nation of Israel. He doesn't want a miraculous crossing the Red Sea. He wants you to think God's word waffles. He wants you to think God's word waffles at creation, that God used theistic evolution perhaps, or threshold creationism, or some of those other compromised positions, and didn't actually create in six literal days. And he doesn't want you to believe that there is a genuine literal crossing of the Red Sea where God cut the sea in half, moved the walls of water apart, blew the wind and dried the land and took the children of Israel across and established them as a nation with whom he had made covenant all the way back in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and guarantees that they will someday have the entire land that God promised to them all the way from the river Euphrates, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, and all the way to the Nile River. Israel has never yet owned that, though they've owned great portions of that during the reigns of David and Solomon. But God guarantees that it's coming someday during the millennium. God keeps his promises. It took a long time to get here, over 400 years to get to this point where Israel's crossing the Red Sea. But God kept his word. And God will continue to keep his word to national Israel. The church is not Israel and Israel is not the church. God is keeping his word to Israel. It was a nation reborn in a day back in May of 1948. And now it has taken its place as one of the leaders in the world. Oh my... Join us when we start studying the book of Revelation. There's some exciting things there. But i got to get back to the text. So here are the questions. First of all, how many chariots were there? Uh, chapter 14, verses 6, 7, and 9. He made ready his chariot, that's Pharaoh, and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. But the Egyptians, verse 9, but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pihahirot, mouth of the gorges, and Baal Tiphon, master of the north. Remember, we talked about those two uh, names and how that identifies for us the exact point of crossing of the Red Sea. It's not up near the Sinai Peninsula someplace. They didn't cross over into Sinai. They wandered for 40 years. There is no trace of 6 million people wandering in the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years. They would have left some sort of trace. There is none. And if you look at your liberal maps in the back of your Bibles, even the conservative Bibles have the liberal maps in them, shows the going down towards St. Catherine's Monastery down at the Jebel Musa, down at the point of Mount si uh, of the Sinai Peninsula, then coming back up again. Question marks all the way along the way. They live right in all the names, but they have question marks. Because there is no evidence of any of those sites. We've covered that in detail in the past, where it was located. So, well, obviously it's clear that there was a minimum of 600 chariots. But I think this appears to be a statement of the elite personal chariot guard of Pharaoh. Egypt at that time was the world's superpower and would have had many more chariots than 600 chariots. Can you imagine the United States today having 600 airplanes or having only 600 tanks? Egypt was the superpower of the day. I suspect they had a lot more chariots than that, hence the statement in verse 7, and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. There was an elite foreguard that went out as this army is marching toward the Red Sea. Thus the actual number of chariots was probably far greater, perhaps five to ten times that number, perhaps 3,000 to 6,000 chariots. Now, just stop and put on your thinking cap for a minute. When you think miracles and judgments of God, think on what's been called the shock and awe scale. Remember when they were going after Saddam Hussein? The, one of the generals made the comment, we're going to give them shock and awe. When you think about the miracles and judgments of God, think shock and awe. God ain't going to squash a little teeny bit of Egyptians down here. God is going to make his name known in all the earth. Number two. How many wheels does that make that God knocked off simultaneously? Now my... <laughs> My message is humorously titled, 1,200 flat tires all at once. But you know, we usually think in terms of two-wheeled chariots, but Egypt also had four-wheeled chariots capable of carrying multiple soldiers to the front lines of the battle. 
That way they wouldn't have to run through the troops and all the fighting. The chariots could plow their way all the way through, and they could plow their way through some of the, the weaker parts of the enemy army so they get soldiers back behind the enemy army and surround them. They had four-wheeled chariots as well as two-wheeled chariots. If all the chariots were two-wheeled, and if only 600 chariots of the personal guard entered the sea, that's a minimum of 1,200 wheels that had simultaneous flat tires. If there were 3,000 to 6,000 two-wheeled chariots, that's 6,000 to 12,000 wheels that fell off all at once. That in itself is a miracle. It's not planned obsolescence, where everything falls apart at once. We got that in our manufacturing today, where things just wear out because they know they could make them last longer, but they want you to buy a new product, so they only let it last so long. If all the chariots were four-wheel chariots, that gives a whopping maximum number of 24,000 wheels that fell off simultaneously. If you have two to four horses pulling even 600 chariots, you have 1,200 horses, huge animals, suddenly in total panic. Imagine the maximum number if every chariot had four horses, that's nearly 100,000 maniac horses who've gone insane. You think anybody got trampled? When you think miracles and judgments of God, think big. We think squatty little thoughts about this big and our God is just, we've got him all in a little tiny box here. You've got the God of the universe you're dealing with and he's going to make a statement that lasts forever. This is the God who created everything and the God who judges sin. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the dweller of the Shekinah glory, who looked out and troubled the Egyptians. The Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son, John chapter 5. This is a huge event that is taking place here. So I think it's obvious to see why there was instant chaos among the charioteers and the recognition of the sovereign hand of God. The probability of 1,200, that's the minimum, 1,200 to 24,000 maximum number of wheels falling off simultaneously, the probability of that is infinitesimally small. Even a pea brain drug addict on angel dust could reach that conclusion. At that moment, we have the first recorded drag race in history. No wheels, the horses were dragging the chariots. Verse 25, And God took off the chariot wheels, and they drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Got a question for you. Have you ever tried to tow a car with no wheels? How fast do you think you could go towing a car with no wheels? Now, you know, last week I, I towed the minivan a thousand miles down to Alabama with a tow dolly, and I had many exciting, almost broke down adventures that maybe I'll tell you someday. But just imagine thousands of poor horses dragging the chariots with no wheels, and the chaos of several thousand chariots and thousands of horses trying to make a U-turn all at once in the pitch dark. Remember, God gave darkness to the Egyptians. Think about thousands of horses trying to make a U-turn to run away. And it's totally dark. Talk about the terror and the chaos even among highly trained and highly skilled military men. Third question, third area of challenge. Did Pharaoh get drowned with his troops? He's clearly on the scene according to verse 6. Verse 6, he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. So that brings us back to the question, who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Now, you know, we studied that in detail. We went through all the Pharaohs. We went up through Egyptian history and all kinds of stuff back when. You remember that we studied to determine the date of the Exodus. Because if you determine from the text the date of the Exodus, then you can determine from history who was the Pharaoh at the time of the date of the Exodus. So we looked at all the different indicators in the biblical text as to the date of the Exodus. And the Bible puts it into a narrow time frame of sometime between 1445 and 1425 B.C. Excuse me, 1440 B.C. Between 1445 and 1440 B.C. So the Pharaoh of the Exodus was not Ramses II. That's the liberal's choice. He didn't rule until 1290 B.C. Remember, numbers go backwards when you're B.C. The reason they want Ramses II to be the Pharaoh of the Exodus 
is because at that time, the capital of Egypt was up in the Nile Delta. And so they say, well, the land of Goshen was the Nile Delta, because that's a very fertile area. And if we can have Ramses II being the pharaoh of the Exodus, that puts the Exodus coming from the Delta, going over to the Sinai Peninsula, and so we can walk through the marshes and get Pharaoh's chariots stuck in the mud, although it says Pharaoh's chariots wheels fell off, and that way we don't have to have a real miracle. You see, there's a lot of things connected. When you have certain assumptions, you will arrive at certain conclusions. You've got to start with the right assumptions to end with the right conclusions. But if you put together all the time indicators in the text, you come up with the date of 1440 to 14, 1445 to 1440 BC. That's fairly well established as to who the pharaoh of that time was. It was Amenhotep II, who was the pharaoh of the Exodus. He ruled from 1450 BC, in other words, five years before the first possible date for the Exodus. He'd only been in power a short period of time. A pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph, remember, is a new guy. And he ruled all the way down till 1425. That means that he came to power right before the Exodus and ruled Egypt for another 15 to 20 years after the Exodus. So the obvious conclusion is, he stood on the shore and hollered, go get them, men! He wanted to make sure that everybody obeyed while he stood there and just glowered at the passing troops. He was there, but it doesn't say that he went into the sea. I think that's relatively easy to understand when we see his previous dealings with Moses and how now he's confronted with a huge hole in the ocean. You know, he was rebellious, he was stubborn, he was self-willed, but he was not stupid. Hmm, wonder if it's a trap. I don't think I'm going in. I'll send in somebody else. You know, even today in military campaigns, the top generals do not plunge into war at the head of the troops, even though they may set up a strategic headquarters close enough to the front lines so that they can direct the troops. Certainly the President of the United States, who is the Commander-in-Chief, like Pharaoh, does not venture into the heat of the battlefront, and further, it's of great interest to notice that the very little is said of Amenhotep II's military accomplishments after this date in history. Even though items about his physical powers and his sporting skills, a lot of that stuff is recorded after this time. Man, he was a really good sportsman. Man, he could shoot the bow. Man, he could throw the javelin. Man, he could run like crazy. All kinds of stuff like that said about him. Never again after this do we see him at the apex of military power. Conclusion, he probably sat this one out. Fourth issue that's raised, and this is the big issue. In fact, there's somebody not here today who wanted to hear this part of the sermon, but they have to listen to the tape. Fourth, how long did it take to cross the Red Sea, and is there enough time given in the text to go 118 miles in that amount of time. Remember, at the point where I posited that the Exodus took place, because in 1445 BC, the capital of Egypt was 480 miles south on the Nile River, right at that bend in the river where there's sort of a, a backward C-shaped bend in the river, where the great cities of Karnak, Thebes, and Luxor are located. The Valley of the Kings, the tomb of Queen Hatshepsut, and we talked about her relationship to Moses, and all the King Tutankhamun, who's, you know, they found his tomb, the grave robbers hadn't managed to find that one. They got into it uh, and found all this gold, this incredible sarcophagus and stuff. 480 miles, which means that, and that's a very fertile area because of that curve in the river there. That area floods every year and brings great produce. <coughs> that's where the land of Goshen was located, not up in the Nile Delta, because Pharaoh was, Moses was making daily trips between the children of Israel and Pharaoh. <coughs> every day, going back and forth, he didn't travel 480 miles each way, you know, basically a thousand miles round trip every day to go visit Pharaoh from the land of Goshen. Pharaoh was able to send out people to check if the land of Goshen was experiencing the same uh, plagues that he was experiencing. And from there, there are two trade routes that run over to the Red Sea. It's at that point that it's 118 miles wide. We won't go back over all that material. So it's 118 miles wide. That's what it is today. It might not have been quite as wide back in 1445 BC because beach erosion probably has made the sea wider in the past 3,500 years. But for the sake of argument, let's use the larger figure of 118 miles. 
Number one, the first thing we need to establish is the minimum amount of time that we are given in the text for the crossing. Always go back to the Bible to establish your benchmarks. You know, it's, it's quite possible that there was a longer period of time since there's supernaturally imposed darkness on the Egyptians and supernaturally uh, provided light for the Jews. But the minimum amount of time that the text gives us, assuming that there's not an extended time of darkness due to that darkness that God imposed on the Egyptians, but the minimum amount of time is 24 hours. Got 24 hours to cross the sea. We know that because first of all, they started out in the morning because it says the east wind blew all night and then they marched. Verse 21 and 22. <clears throat> Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. So, after that all night wind, they moved out in early morning. We get that from verses 21 and 22. The second thing, that we learn from the text is it was morning when God took off the chariot wheels of Pharaoh's army. Look at verse 24. It came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians <coughs> through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. You know, a straightforward reading of the text would indicate that we're not talking about the same morning that the chariots entered into the sea following the Jews. In other words, the Egyptians were not just a few yards offshore when the water fell in on them. That would mean the Egyptians chased the Jews hard all day and all night long until the following morning. That gives us a minimum of 24 hours until the next normal daybreak. Number three, that minimum time is supported by what the Jews saw in the morning. When they arrived on the far side of the sea, it says they saw the dead bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the shore and they never saw any Egyptians after that. Now to be able to see the dead bodies of the Egyptians, they were obviously not still in Egypt waiting to make their crossing. So, you know, they saw suicide while the Egyptians ran into the sea, got drowned, washed up on the shore. They stood there and said, oh, look, dead bodies. Then God opened it up again, then they went across. That didn't happen. But they saw the dead bodies of the Egyptians who were following them very closely and they would obviously have washed up on the same shore where the Jews had fled. Look down at verse 29. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. So, are they standing in Egypt, looking at Egyptians wa washing back up into Egypt? Or are they standing on the other side, washing, watching Egyptians wash up, dead Egyptians wash up onto the seashore, where they're on the other side? They had obviously made their crossing all the way across, and God washed up dead Egyptians to show them what he had done. To remind them who he is. To show them that he's the sovereign God with all the power of the universe. Number four, you say, man, could they have done that? Could you, could you keep going for 24 hours? Well, lots of people have done that who are running for their lives. There are many people who have gone 24 hours, you know, throughout the history of the world. That's no big deal. But what if you have that many people, six million Jews? Could they all have done it? You know, Pharaoh had just finished putting all the Jews through a mandatory national physical fitness program. Psalm 105 goes through the plagues of Egypt, and it includes these verses. Here's verse 36 and 37. He smote also all the firstborn of their land, the chief of all their strength. So that's the plague immediately before the crossing. Verse 37. He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Everybody was in shape. They might not have liked it when they were working in slavery in, in Egypt, but God brought every one of them across. Nobody died of a heart attack all the way along the way. Now you got to remember also, I can't believe our time is up. <laughs> we're gonna, I'll move at least through this next section and then I'll stop. And then we'll go on from there next week. Just remember, the Jews were in a panic. They would be moving as fast as they could. 
Of course, God could have chosen to give them supernatural strength since he kept their clothing and shoes from wearing out during the 40 years of wilderness wandering. The Bible tells us that specifically. But there is no special supernatural strength like Samson mentioned in the text. And you know, it's really not necessary. You know, I used to be a distance runner when I was in high school and college. A good schoolboy time for a three to five mile course, I ran cross country. And when we ran against high schools, it was two and a half miles. College freshmen, we ran against them, it was three miles. College varsity, we ran against them five miles. That, the good schoolboy time is about five minutes per mile. The really good runners could average four minutes and 20 seconds to four minutes and 30 seconds per mile. Most of the slower boys on the team could run three to five miles averaging six minutes per mile. An easy warm up or a warm down jog where all of us were running together, where we were talking and laughing, nobody really sweating it, would average about 12 minutes per mile. In other words, that works out to five miles jogged in an hour at an easy pace. Five miles per hour jogged at an easy pace. And remember, everybody's in excellent shape at this point. If you keep that up for 24 hours, you know how many miles that is? 120 miles. What do we say? The Red Sea is approximately 118 miles wide at the proposed point of crossing. 120 miles, pretty close. So the time allotted and the distance to be crossed are not only reasonable, but I think are expected in light of the minimum time given in the text. If you assume more time, for example, if you assume that supernatural darkness was imposed for an extra day in there, if you assume 48 hours instead of 24 hours, since you have a morning starting point and a morning ending point, everybody could have easily walked with no rush in that amount of time. Remember, the Jews were in prime physical shape according to the inspired text, and they were clearly scared out of their wits. Their adrenaline was pumping, the fear and flight response was in high gear, the noise of thousands of screaming Egyptian warriors on their heels, giant walls of water on both sides, they were traveling lights, mothers hugging their babies, dads and teenagers helping the little kids. Only one way out, straight ahead. Nobody stopped to smell the roses or the dead fish. They couldn't see the Egyptians, but they certainly could hear them stomping at their rear. Remember, after creation, this is the principal miracle of the Old Testament and the Bible repeatedly refers to the Exodus as the point at which God brought Israel as a nation into existence. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. It's exciting because you are the God of shock and awe when it comes to power and judgment. You are the God who makes his point so that all the world might know that you are God. We worship you. We honor you. We adore you. We thank you that you have provided a hedge of protection for us, a wall on every side to keep the enemy from us. We pray that we might learn to walk by faith through the place which seems impossible with the one opening that you've left for us to go and that we might walk quickly with confidence in obedience to your word. Father, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number.